What's up guys, Creighton here from Logic Lounge Gaming. I am in some terribly, terribly cold weather. It is raining and we're parked at a gate. Yes, we're back in Flight Simulator 10. You guys seemed to have loved the video that we did before this uh, with Flight Simulator, so let's do another one. This time we are in Europe, going to be doing a flight from Gatwick, London Gatwick, to uh, Rotterdam. No, Rotterdam? No. Hamburg. There we go. Let's try to think of the right airport there. We are going to Hamburg, Germany. It will be about a 40-minute flight like the last video, which should be good to go. So if you've watched the last video, you'll know that the setup procedures are pretty simple to do, and that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to start setting up our cockpit to get ready to go. First off, you guys know that I need to start my battery power and go ahead and get connected to ground power like so meaning that we are now running off ground power and we can start getting set up with our flight. Flight it is going to be um, all right at best. It is, you know, raining, like I said, so we're going to have to deal with some of that. We're going to go ahead, turn on and arm those emergency exit lights. We are also going to get started as well, turning on that window heat, getting the recirculation fans going, putting the isolation valve into auto, kind of just going down my main checks. You kind of want to work from left to right here. So we're going to work left to right. We don't uh, really have to do anything thus far in these panels. Oh, we can turn on a panel light. It's about 8 a.m. right now in uh, Gatwick. So uh, the sun is just coming up. We want to turn on that fast and seat belt sign because we want all of the people coming onto the plane to sit down, put their seat belts on, and get ready to go. And at this point now that I have power running to the plane, it was when we would start to load the plane as well. And that's what is going to be happening right now. Oh, if I have not mentioned, this is a 737-800 in the wonderful British Airways paint. Now you guys might say a little bit of inaccuracies here with British Airways not flying 737-800s. That is true, but this is right now mimicking a 737-400 flight, which you can see actually off there in the background, uh, just to the right of my plane. You can see how a little bit similar they are. It's just a little bit shorter, but back into the cockpit. Let's get getting set up here. I have my notes down in front of me as well to make sure I'm doing all of my procedures correctly here. We are going to switch our IRSs into nav mode. It's going to start aligning them and making sure that our plane knows where it's going. Uh, we are done with this upper panel right now. Nothing really that we need to put up here. So we're going to move down. This panel we just set up as well. Uh, don't need to mess with anything right now there. Down here at our radio stacks, really what we can turn on is our panel lights and we can go ahead and I, I know it's not really what we're supposed to do right now, but we'll go ahead and turn on our transponder just so the wonderful people at Gatwick know that we are transmitting our signal. Now, that kind of finishes and wraps it up for right now. What we're going to do is head, excuse me, into our CDU. CM, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's got a, a ton of different names, but this is basically the flight management computer, FMS, some people call it the CDU, the control, you know, wh wh whatever you want to call it, you know what you want to call it. Uh, so we're going to go back to, into the FMC here. We're going to initialize our position, which we're going to take from our GPS, which says that uh, we are in north and west right there. So we're going to take that and we're, whoops, going to go back, set our IRS positions. You'll see that the displays behind me have popped on. Now we're going to set our reference airport to EGKK, which is London Gatwick, and we're going to go into our route. Now our route is actually a company route for the British Airways, so we actually have a flight plan already to go, and you can see in co-route, we're actually going to put in EGKK and uh, uh, la, 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 what is it? It is... Uh, I completely forgot. It's uh, E ham, E H A M, right? E ham zero one. We'll put that in company route, and it auto fills almost all of the data for us. We're gonna go ahead and activate this route, and then go into departures and arrivals because we need to set up our departures and arrivals. Today we will be going through two six left, so we're gonna select two six left, and we've got the Daga one A departure, one X departure, DAGA, one X departure right there. That's the one we want. And our departure is now set up and we're going to go into our arrival. I know for a fact that we're going to be landing ILS 18 right. 
So we're going to put that in there. And I know for a fact as well that it's going to be the Rediff uh, 1A. Rediff 1A. So we're going to look for that one. It's right there. We're going to select it. Uh, I do not know the transition, though. I should have looked up that transition. I actually think uh, I can, if you give me one moment here. Uh, I, I had written down this uh, this plan here, and I really kind of forgot about it. So we're going to take one look here at our flight plan. It is da, 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 that one. Let's see, where is it? Bum, ba, da, ba, da. Oh, actually, yeah, it uh, should be a river. That is the one that we're going to go with, and we're going to say activate. Now we're going to go check our route. To do that, we're going to go down to the central map right here, and we're going to kind of take a look at our legs of this route and see where it's taking us. So you can see we're going to be taking off, doing a sharp left-hand turn there, and we're going to step along, see where we're going, and we're going to just make sure that uh, we aren't running into route disconnect discontinuities, whatever you want to call it. I am horrible at calling that. Uh, we do have a root discontinuity. Blah, 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 blah. I still can't say that word. Um, we are going to, I don't think we're actually going to go river. We're actually going to go to the D220, that one. So we'll make a right-hand turn right there, which I think yep, will get us into, whoa, it's not where we want to go. See, this is why you check your routes. We're actually going to go East H644, and we're going to make it connect to Segold right there. So there we go. So now we go straight across, and we are going to get put right onto the ILS like so, like that, and we'll be able to land so-and-so, hopefully. Now, we're going to set up our payloads here. We're actually going to take an 85% load today. And our fuel is in kilograms, meaning that I now need to convert my pounds because my program that I use for planning my flights gives me the weights in pounds. So I need to convert it to kilograms. And it is going to be 70, 40 kilograms, 70, 40 kilograms. So that's about a 33%. We're actually going to bump that up just a 34% load just so I have enough gas to get there. Now we're going to take that total number, add it to our gross weight. It also gives us a zero fuel weight. We want two as our reserves, and we're going to be using a cost index of 80. Now I know it says our trip cruise is 290, actually going to be going 230 right now because that was optimal for my flight. And we're going to be taking off with five degrees of flaps, a center of gravity weight of 25.5%, giving us a trim of 4.62. That will come in in just one moment. And we have our V1, VR, and V2 speeds. Now, Coming back to that trim speed, this is where we're going to come down here to this wheel, and we're going to lock it in at about 4.62, which, meh, right about there uh, does it for us. It basically just helps us get off the ground so we're not having to excessively pull up on the stick. And that about does it for setting up the uh, FMC. All we need to do now is go into uh, our autopilot here and key in those numbers. We're going up to an altitude of 230. We're going a initial speed of about 175. And that will do us right there. We're also going to put on flight director, which will be nice. And uh, we're not going to do anything thus far. Now we're going to turn on our uh, rejected takeoff auto brake. So if I have to do a rejected takeoff, I will be okay for that. Now uh, I need to take that out of plan mode. There we go. So we're good there. Uh, that about does it for all of our steps, uh, getting the plane ready. At this point, we could probably say that everybody's uh, boarded and we're ready to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to switch on our APU. And to do that, we're going to switch on our fuel and we're also going to switch on hydraulics as well. And then we're going to hit this snazzy little APU button. 
And we're also going to turn on our anti-collision lights because a jet engine, which the APU is, is now running. So we are going to uh, have some fun there as I actually get out my procedural checklist. That's right, I actually have a procedural checklist for this plane. It's that advanced that I actually need to uh, have a checklist here. So we're going to go over everything right now. So here's our pre-flight checklist. We have all the charts and nav data. We have departure weather, destination weather. We have all of our weather. We already set up our flight plan, so we have all of those. And we have our dispatch papers. Yes, I actually have dispatch papers. Now, our pre-flight includes checking the oxygen, which actually makes us go down over here and check this guy make sure that we have oxygen we do uh, our navigation uh, transfer switches are all good our window heats are on and good precision auto mode is selected we need to select this actually to two three zero uh, we can now actually transfer over the power to the apu as well so preservation mode is checked flight instruments are checked parking brake is set and engine start levers are are at idle. So that's our pre-flight checklist. Let's now go ahead and go into our before start checklist because we're actually ready to go right now. So here's our before start checklist. Our flight deck door is closed and locked. Fuel is all loaded. Passenger side signs are on. Windows are closed and locked. Our MCP, which we just set up, is good. We already went over our takeoff speed. CDU pre-flight is complete. Everything is free and zero. And taxi and takeoff briefing, uh, briefing which this is, is complete. We also have our anti-collision light on because that's when we turned on the APU. And we're now ready for our before taxi checklist. That means that we're actually good to go on backing up and getting this flight off the ground. So we're going to do that by starting our flight. Now, uh, this is going to be a pretty short flight, so it won't be too bad here. So we're going to go ahead and initiate the sky bridge to detach from our plane, which you can see there, it is now moving back, meaning that we can also now go outside, kind of doing our visual inspection, checking that there isn't any planes going to be taxing where we're going to go. And there actually is an air transat. So we need to wait for it to leave. And now, since it is leaving, what we can do is I'm going to bring up my CPU one more time because since we're working off of APU power, we actually don't need any ground instruments anymore or, or ground power and ground air conditioning. And now that that plane has actually passed, we can begin our back up, which I just initiated. So while we're backing up, we're actually going to start now turning on our plane. First, now we're going to start engine number two. So engine number two is spooling up here or should be spooling up here one moment. You'll see in this center display right here, which I just popped out or attempted to pop out. There we go. You can see the number rising, 14, 15. We want that, that to get to 25 before we initiate our uh, cutoff switches. So 23, 24, and 25. So we're gonna go ahead and initiate that. And engine number two is beginning to spool up. You also see us starting to turn here Going onto the taxiway, another British Airways plane right there. Kind of stuck in between two British Airways planes right now as we back up and get ready to go. Now, this is default AI traffic from uh, Flight Sim. It just has different skins on it. There's a program out there uh, that you can get AI aircraft. This isn't like a fancy payware one. So there will be hiccups, and some planes may actually be uh, on each other. So the engine number two just switched over, so we're actually going to go to engine number one now and wait for it to spool up. Also, we're going to be checking to make sure we're backing up okay. So that one's spooling up now. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, getting closer as we're almost parallel with this runway, or the, sorry, taxiway, excuse me. i got to know your right stuff. So our pushback is now complete, so we're going to set the parking brake once again uh, so that we won't go anywhere as we get our engine spooled up. So engine number one is now coming online, and we want to wait for that uh, to happen before we need to do anything else. 
Uh, I'm also going to be turning on some things for my map down here. You'll see that I just actually activated the terrain map. Let me zoom out here. You might be able to see the terrain. If you see those yellow dots, it means that there's terrain that I might hit. So that's useful for me. And I also turn on data as well. Data allows me to see when exactly I'm going to be arriving at my next waypoint, which I find useful for me. I'm also going to be turning on my uh, traffic. TCAS so that I know where the traffic is and now that that second motor or engine I guess is on we're good to go with transferring the bus power over to the engines turning off the APU turning on our packs so we can keep our passengers nice and warm or cold depending on what the weather is and we can turn on our taxi lights so let's go for our pre taxi checklist or actually our taxi checklist our generators are on, probe heat is on, anti-ice we do not need, so uh, it will not be uh, on right now. Our isolation valves are on auto, engine start switches are in continuous, recall is checked, auto brake is in RTO, engine start levers are idle, flight controls are checked, and ground equipment is clear. So we're good to go with our taxi. So let's go ahead here, and it looks like a plane just taxied around us, so we're actually going to follow it out to the runway. Here we go. I have released the parking brake, adding just a tad of engine power as we head off to, where are we going, 26 left? Heading out to 26 left. And, you know, I hate to say it, most of the time here, these planes really fly themselves. You're really responsible for a fraction of of the time. I mean, you do have to monitor it, yes, but is it life-threatening during, uh, you know, the ground movements? Yeah, some people can complain, yes, some people can complain, no, um, but I'll leave that up to you. So it looks like this Air Transat is actually going to go park, whereas we're going to turn right after we turn over here and head down. If you guys don't know, that plane in front of us is actually an A300 from Airbus. Uh, oh, it looks like we've got some planes coming out here, but they're waiting for that Air Transat. So we're actually going to be sneaking in front of these guys as we head out uh, and turn right here. Uh, we've got First Choice Airlines and Air Transat, it looks like, uh, which are aircraft carriers, actually real-life aircraft uh, carriers uh, that do fly. Some of them might be outdated. I'm not sure how uh, up-to-date my AI is. Uh, but we're going to head on over here now. Now, 26 left is not the runway closest to us. It is actually the one on the other side of where we need to go. So we're going to have to navigate over there. And I'm not doing this with the assistance of any ATC. So like the last video, you might see some uh, hiccups with the planes, um, them being on top of each other, some being run into each other. Uh, you know, but that is to, you know, be one of those things that I guess just happens. So we're moving out here. Uh, we're actually going to do an intersection takeoff as well, uh, which will be nice. But let's go through our before takeoff checklist. Our flaps are actually coming down right now. Like I said, we're doing five flaps. Our stabilizer trim is set to what we need it to be, and we're good to go there. Next up is our after takeoff checklist, which will be after takeoff. How convenient. Let's see what other airlines we got over here. We got Monarch. It looks like they're in the distance. That's that yellow and blue one. Um, that should be nice. Uh, some things that you might notice um, from this video to the video before is I'm actually using uh, a tweaked config file within Flight Simulator 10. And this tweaked config file allows me to uh, have a better level of graphics ability and to fully use my computer because you got to think flight simulator 10 back in the day only utilized one cpu core it also wasn't meant to be run at very high graphics i don't even know they didn't even know why they had the ultra high graphics in the first place well now that's kind of changed with all these very fast computers that allow us to get all these games and one of the um, games coming out right now uh, called prepare 3d which is actually a simulation program which was bought the code of flight simulator 10 uh, really improves upon all of that but I'll, i think i'll talk about that later in flight right now we are here at two six left we're going to be visually checking if it is clear and it is clear so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead put on 
our overhead lights, uh, which are our landing lights, plus we're turning on our strobe and basically lighting up the plane to make sure that it is all lit up and nice. From here, we're also going to turn on our auto throttle arm button, which will allow us to take off with the correct speed of thrust as we lift off here. So we're now taxing on to the runway and we're going to get going here in just one second. So right turn, right turn, right turn. And here we go. We're also going to be turning on our wipers because yes, it is raining and yes, we do have wipers that work. So why not use them? So right now we're waiting for 80 knots, which we're just about to pass and 80 knots. Usually the captain will call this out. Uh, and now we're looking for V1 and V rotate, which should be at the same time because this is a plane that doesn't need one. So here we go. We got V1 and V rotate. So we pull the nose back and we just float right into the air. I say gear up, gear is coming up and we're gradually gaining altitude which is good. Now, once I get to a certain point, I can enable the autopilot, which will be good for us because we can get going uh, on our track. So I should actually be able to enable that right now. And yep, there we go. VNAV, LNAV. We are now climbing up on our flight path that we have already, uh, you know, declared, put in our flight plan. So basically if ATC was to, you know, lose contact with us right now, they'd know exactly where we're going because that's our published route. Now, amazingly, there's not a cloud in the sky, yet it's still showing we have a little bit of rain, or at least on my end, it's showing we have a little bit of rain. Uh, so we're just going to keep this on until the rain goes away. It is pretty windy here. Uh, we also have enough adequate speed as well. So what's going to happen is our flaps are going to come up here. Let's see if I can get a wing view. There's a good wing view right there. You can see those flaps kind of coming up here. Um, there is not a winglet version of this plane uh, for British Airways because, uh, you know, British Airways with their 737-400s, they don't fly very long routes. So there's no uh, advantage for them to having winglets because of their domestic routes aren't very long. Now, coming back in the cockpit here, looks like our rain has stopped. So we're actually going to turn off these wipers and we're going to go off our after takeoff checklist. After takeoff checklist, engine bleeds are on, packs are on auto, landing gear is up and off, which is confirmed, and our flaps are up with no lights, which is also confirmed as well. So, our next checklist is going to be our descent checklist. The plane right now is bringing us up to our uh, published altitude uh, in the flight plan, so that should be good here. Uh, actually gonna probably mess with our, my FMC here because British routes are very different to American routes, which I don't know why, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not complaining because I don't fly, you know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not an English, uh, you know, controller or I'm not, sorry, not a controller, I'm not an English uh, pilot, I'm an American pilot. So what I know to be what the normal procedures are in uh, the US aren't the same in Britain. One thing that will strike you mostly as different is the transition altitude. The transition altitude is basically saying after you get above this height, it's basically the same air pressure, and we want you to be at the same air pressure so that we can kind of keep track of you. Now, in America, that is flight level 180, 18,000 feet in the air. In Britain, though, it's a little bit different. It's actually at a couple thousand feet that they have this, and um, by now, we'd actually be in standard, so I'm actually going to put us in standard right now, which is 2992 in the American uh, way. British pilots uh, are, I believe, are millibars, is what they call it. So it's like, um, oh, I don't know how they say it in, in, in millibars. I, I, I just know that it's in millibars by um, looking how uh, it, it happens in the British sense of 
what's here. So uh, right now we're kind of climbing all the way up. We're actually going to start. I'm going to start that timer there. Um, usually when pilots take off, they will start a timer. That's what you see in the left-hand screen right there. It says zero, uh, or sorry, nine zero nine, which means that's the current local time right now, nine a.m. or actually nine oh nine a.m. And the zeros below it is actually our lapsed time. Now, just because I started it right now, uh, it will be counting up since I pressed that button, and we'll see how long our flight plan really is. Now. We're just going to continue up to our destination altitude, which is flight level 230. And the plane is basically flying itself. Uh, we will get reconcerned with the plane when we start our descent. When we start our descent, we'll be able to uh, set up our ILS. We'll also be looking at uh, our approach speeds, our approach path, checking our approaches as well and all of that fun and jazz so that's that right now um, as we're climbing I guess I can show you a little bit around maybe uh, this plane so you guys can kind of see the 737 I mean this is kind of uh, this is a one configuration for the 737 there are multiple different configurations for the 737, including different MCPs, which is uh, this upper bar right here. Uh, there's an older one and a newer one. Uh, because we are trying to replicate the 737-400, this is actually using uh, what is called the old method. Uh, or, or the old layout and that basically is this Honeywell I think I believe it's Honeywell um, MCP and it, it looks quite different than the newer ones um, and then of course down here our displays our displays are different you see these multiple uh, ones in displays um, and this is an actual configuration and what this is trying to mimic is this is trying to mimic how the older 737s were uh, if you have ever seen any pictures of older 737s you know that they have mostly analog dials in them and for fleets that have these older aircraft they don't want to make their pilots have to relearn everything within flight or not flight simulator just have their pilots relearn everything so they can order their planes in this configuration and this configuration closely resembles all of the dials that you would have had in the older 737s that have the analog dials so this is you know basically how it would look in front of you you would have your indicator right here your artificial horizon uh, you'd have your speed indicator like this here i mean it would be dials just go google uh old 737 content you'll see what i'm saying um, and now that they've uh, started modernizing all of this really is kind of obsolete um, in the newer version, if you actually go back to my video with the Alaska Airlines plane, the, the I believe it was the uh, Seattle to Spokane flight, you'll notice that these displays all had only one indication on them. The left display, which would be this display right here, you can see it, it would be the one that's blanked out. Uh, you see this one blanked out right here uh, that display would only show this artificial horizon and on the left and right hand side of that artificial horizon would be your altitude and your speed and that's basically what that would be uh, and you know I'm, I'm explaining what the new cockpit is um, and this is how the old cockpit looks where you have your DMEs you have your navigation stuff like that you have more information stuck on these panels than the older versions on this middle panel right here that I just popped out you would only have the navigation now if you also look here you see that T slash C that stands for top of climb that is the place where we're going to reach the top of our climb up to our altitude which is nice because that makes uh, means that we get there uh, you know what I think let me check here let's uh, let's edit our route here um, we as pilots can request direct to certain points that may make it faster for us one of these points for us right now is this red fa. Where is it? It's right. Doo, 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 doo. There, red fa. 
Now we can request direct to Redfa, and you see we just now are cutting our time in half by turning right and going straight to Redfa. What we would, would have done is we would have gone straight out here a little bit more and then turned. That would have, in turn, made us burn more fuel. It would have also made us, uh, you know, added more time to us. So uh, we did this as kind of like a, you know, um, uh, what would it be? Whatever the center equivalent is in the UK. I'm sorry, I'm not a, I'm not a UK pilot, like I keep saying, so I don't know everything. So you can correct me if you want. I'm more of an American pilot and more know the American procedures. Sorry. Moving on, though. So basically, we're just cutting down our time. Um, you can see now, in only 80 miles, we will reach our top of descent, which will make it a very fast flight. So that is going. The center console actually would be about the same uh, on the new planes, kind of getting back to what we were talking about before, except uh, these two by four row right here would actually be the full of the screen and everything about this oil pressure would actually be not there, but actually on this lower screen, which is actually showing our navigation right now. So there you guys go. A quick overview of what this would look like, uh, how we would uh, deal with everything, and kind of what the new and old schemes are. Most of the planes now, coming off the 737 line, do not have this type of cockpit configuration. Most of the airlines are saying, well, we're just going to go with the more modern one because that's where we're going. More modern. So, that's what they're doing. Now, let's go ahead and take a look around this plane. Uh, it, it's nothing too special, really. Um, British Airways, this is uh, one of this is their def uh, this is their default paint. I want to call it their default paint, but you don't really have a default paint. This is British Airways' current paint scheme for their aircraft. Now, aircraft and airplanes usually go through new paint schemes every four to five to maybe six or seven years. This one has been the default one for a while now for British Airways. Um, and as I realized this, I forgot we want to turn off our uh, landing lights as well as all the lights that we don't need. There we go. Silly me. Because I'm adding commentary and stuff. So, this is how it would look if you were to fly a British Airways plane right now. That's how it would look. They have different paint schemes. I actually like one of their older ones. One of their older ones was very blue. Um, it was uh, nice as well. I, I liked it, but this one's all right, too. I don't mind this one. So um, that's what it looks like here. Oh, no. Oh, no. The plane is frozen. The game is frozen. Do not touch it. Oh, there we go. Whew, that was close. Sometimes it likes to freeze on you for just no reason at all. Um, and while I'm outside, I want to I wanna explain one thing to you guys. If you see... Oh, crap. It froze again. Don't. Don't. There we go. Okay. If you see here... You see that white coming out of the back of the plane? Let me help you with some misconceptions here. No, these do not control the weather. They have nothing to do with the weather. What it is is because the plane is expelling hot gases because it's burning fuel. Yes, burning fuel causes it to heat up, just like your car. Like if you run your car for a couple hours and you place your hand on the hood, it's going to feel hot, right? Same thing with this. You're running the engines. They're going to be hot. So just like it is on a cold winter's day, up in the atmosphere where we are right now, it's cold. What happens when hot meets cold? Condensation. It is condensation trails or contrails. Sometime it, sometimes excuse me, it can be up there for long periods of time because the uh, the weather isn't changing that much. So it kind of freezes it in place, and it'll dissipate after a while. It does not control the weather. Ah, I don't know how many people have told me, oh, you know those contrails from the plains. They control the weather. Ah, bah humbug. No, they don't. So just want to you know, get past that misconception there, but we're actually going to hop back inside the plane uh, and stay safe inside the plane, and hopefully it won't lock up, uh, lock up. Because uh, I really would like to do this flight and not have it crash and then have to re-record this flight. And, you know, you may never see this recording. I may be just talking to myself right now, and you will never see the light of day of this. 
or it could go how it's supposed to go, and you would hear my nonsensical rambling on because I'm just trying to fill time between this uh, now about 50 miles to go before our top of descent. And literally, this is how a pilot would be. You may call the pilot lazy, but he does a ton of work between the top of descent, or excuse me, between the, yes, the top of descent and the landing. The pilot is doing extraordinary amount of work, having to make sure that he's listening to air traffic control, doing what air traffic control says he needs to do, making sure that his flight computer is all set up for the approach. He's on the right approach so that he's not landing into traffic, causing a crash. You know, there's tons of factors and pilots have to look out for everything. They have to be self-aware. They have to be able to make decisions. They have to be able to know when to disregard, uh, ATC. One big thing is if the TCAS, which is the um, program that kind of allows uh, to show you if you're going to be hitting another aircraft or not, it'll tell you to descend or pull up. He'll have to um, decide whether he follows the plane, which might tell him to descend, or the ATC controller, which may be telling him to ascend, which may lead you into a crash. And that is actually a real-life situation right there. I just described something that actually happened, not only over, not over the United States, though, uh, but actually over Russia. There's actually an aircraft investigation video around this as well. I think it was a uh, DHL 757 and some sort of Russian made passenger jet uh, their paths crossed uh, and somehow they were at the same flight level um, the plane was telling them to descend one plane was telling them to ascend and basically the ATC was telling it backwards and one of the pilots was actually listening to the controller and one of the pilots was actually listening to uh, their TCAS system so they ended up ramming into each other. Everybody died. It was a sad, sad day. Um, so there's a lot of things that pilots have to do between, you know, sitting back and relaxing to actually doing work. Uh, just think of them at cruise as their lunch break or, well, actually not lunch break, but as their kind of break. Um, because the, the, the flight management computer is taking over really everything that it needs to take over making them fly, making sure they're at the right, right level. I mean, pilots aren't, you know, like, up and about inside of the cockpit doing random things, not paying attention. No, 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 no. They're always looking at the controls. They're always looking at what they're supposed to be at and uh, referencing that between what they're indicating at as well so that, that, you know, you have a safe flight, which is the key there. Safe flight, no crashes, no nothing. Safe flights. You want that. And I think pilots do incredibly well. Um, they have knowledge power out of the wahoozle of stuff like that. It's pretty insane. Kind of cool as well. Um, and yeah. Um, so we're good there. There's my little rant. Filled up sometime, actually. We're less than 20 miles from the top of descent. So uh, we can actually... Yeah, let's go into our descent checklist. Our descent checklist is as follows. Our preservation landing altitude is set to 200 feet above sea level. Our recall, our real switches are checked. Auto brake is checked. Landing data we need to put in right now. So we're going to bring up our FMC here. You can see here we have three selections. We can either land with flaps 15 flaps 30 or flaps 40. I go all the way and I do flaps 40. So we're gonna do flaps 40. It suggests a speed of 140 knots for arrival. So we're gonna put that in and tell the FMC that that's what we want to land. So now it'll configure itself for that landing, which is good. So we have the ref and minimum speeds. Approach briefing is complete. We now are going to wait for our landing briefing, which will happen about 10 miles out from the airport. And then from then, we can uh, head off into the other checklist. So I'm going to set that aside here. And 
zoom in this map. We're getting quite close now as I bring up this map. You can see uh, we're getting quite close. That TD is top of descent. We just crossed, I believe this is the English Channel. Um, so this is what we're crossing. We're, we're going from uh, the British area to the German area, which is pretty exciting. Yay. Um, fun fact that I learned recently about uh, the European, Un European Union. Excuse me. I can't talk tonight for some reason. Really cool thing about the European Union. So all of these different Europe countries, including Great Britain, Germany, Switzerland, France, all of these countries, and they basically are in the sense of the United States, where, hey, we have this treaty, we have a common currency, we'll open up our borders, and you can just cross our borders whenever you feel like it. Like, if I was a resident of the country of France, I'm a France citizen, basically saying... I am a citizen of the United States, but in the fact that I can go over to Spain, I can go over to Great Britain. Well, actually, no, Great Britain is a different story. Uh, I can go over to Spain, I can go over to Switzerland, and I can just cross into it. Don't have to go through immigration, don't have to pass any fancy checkpoints. It's literally just a line in the ground that I can step on over in between and I'm in a different country and I think that's really really cool about the European Union it gives itself uh, a kind of hybrid of countries and states and uh, while we're turning here it's, it's wanting me to reset my MCP which is gonna allow us to start to land so uh, I'm taking that down to our approach altitude now and we're good to go uh, and I'll input all of our ILS stuff in a minute so like I was saying the European Union is kind of a hybrid between states and countries in the fact that like states you can cross into almost all of the European Union members without so much as a pat down a grope or walking through a metal detector which is awesome at the same time you're also ha able to have one currency the euro where Great Britain is also an exception with the pounds. And you kind of have this really cool thing of, hey, I'm a state, but I'm also a country. I'm my own individual person. I can make my own rules, make my own laws, make everything that I want to make. But I have the added benefit of allowing people into my country whenever I want without having to have too many regulations. I think that's amazing. And... Uh, getting back to Great Britain, they have an exception into this um, where they print their own money and they will screen anybody coming into their country, whether they're a part of the European Union or not. There is a really great video up on YouTube that explains all of this. I believe the YouTube username is CPG Gray. CPG Gray? I think something like that. Uh, you'll find him. He's got like a little cog wheel uh, as his icon. He makes incredible videos. He's got, I think it's a, a two-part series on uh, what the European Union is. He goes into much more detail about this, but I think it's pretty awesome how it works. But moving on now, let's go ahead and reference our ILS. Now, because our FM our FMS is so awesome like it is it actually has stored the ILS information for the airport if you don't know what ILS is it's the instrument landing system it basically allows the plane to land itself with little to no input now this is just a basic level arrival there are different levels of arrival called cats and uh, I believe this is just a cat one arrival, meaning that it has uh, vertical speed and longitudinal, and I do the rollout and everything else uh, on my own. Whereas a cat three, which is the maximum, there's a cat one, cat two, and a cat three. The cat three is for very, 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 very horrible weather. Say it's fogged in, you can't see the runway until the last minute. 
What this Cat 3 allows you to do is it allows a uh, more precisioned approach, meaning it's going to tell you when to flare or to tip the nose up so the, la the back wheels land first. It's going to tell you how to roll out. It's going to assist you in more ways than you can think of for landing than what a Cat 1 arrival is. Cat 1 arrival is just, hey, you're on the ground, take it over, I'm not doing this anymore. Cat 3, eh, sit back. Well, actually, not really sit back, but eh, take a, take a load off. I'll do the landing for you, just monitor me a little bit. That's what a Cat 3 is. We're doing Cat 1 today because, as you can see, it's pretty clear outside. Whoops, there we go. It's pretty clear outside, not really a lot of clouds down there. Um, I think that's actually snow out there in the distance. So, like I was saying, we're going to start up this uh, ILS. We're going 1-8 right. So, we want our ILS frequencies, which is going to be this one right here, to 1-10-10. 10. And I set this in both navigation radios, and I make them actives. So, 1-10-10, 1-10-10. So, if there's ever any issues with autopilot number one, because there's, there's actually a... Uh, left autopilot and a right autopilot, depending on which, uh, who is flying. Because my co-pilot, who should be right there in that empty seat, could take over, turn on autopilot on their side, and navigate from their side. Uh, but it's kind of a unity right now. We, we're doing it both. Uh, and also from here, we want to put in our course. Our course is the true, uh, uh, the true, uh, I don't want to say course, the true heading. There we go. The true heading of the runway. The runway states that it's 1-8 right, but it is in actuality 1-8-3. Those three degrees make a huge difference. So 1-8-3, and we're going to go over on the co-pilot side, 1-8-3 as well. And once that's tuned in, we're ready to land. Uh, we're just going to keep kind of descending through the altitudes here. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to put us on the path for the localizer. What the localizer is, is it tells the plane whether to go left or to go right. The one stipulation is that I can't really activate it right now. The localizer is basically this big beacon facing at the end of the runway and out. And you have to be within the radius of the beacon to pick it up because it won't tell you oh turn left for 180 degrees no it'll be like turn left one or two degrees turn right another one or two degrees and it'll kind of get you on that straight course usually with flights what they do is they catch the localizer so basically they're catching the straightness of the runway and then they catch the glide slope you usually come in a little bit below what the glide slope is. And I'll explain the glide slope when we get there. But the glide slope is basically that optimal rate of descent that you want so that you make it to the runway without having to put your nose into the ground and without going too fast. And because this is a Cat 3 approach, I have to have input. And my input, once I'm on the glide slope, is slowing us down enough where I can extend flaps, and we can land at a safe speed, which for us today is 140 knots. So hopefully that explains a lot for you. I'm doing a lot of talking, so I'm going to take a drink of water. Much better. Okay, so... Oh, not, not, not better. <clears throat> there we go. So, we are on our descent. Now, let me bring up here my map one more time. You see this decel. This decel means for us that this is one of the most optimal times that we can start putting our flaps down and we can start slowing down to our final approach speed. Now, because I know a lot about this, there's something in the air traffic controlling universe called prioritization. Prioritization is basically letting certain planes take off and land at certain times. And this has to do with a phenomenon called wing vortices. Wing vortices 
are little pockets of air that come out of the tips of wings. These create massive, massive spirals of air. And if you put a small aircraft behind a very large aircraft, you kind of see where I'm going here. That small aircraft is going to be blown around by those vortices coming out of the back of the plane. Now, because I know a lot about this, I can tell you something. If you have a heavy aircraft, meaning a 777, 767, 747, heck, even the A380, you need to leave a three minute gap, three whole minutes, the plane behind it cannot go. If the plane behind it goes, it could be subject to those wingtip vortices. What might happen, you say? The plane might turn on its side. You could get some very heavy turbulence, and if you're low enough to the ground, you're probably going to crash into it. So, that's why they have prioritizations, because smaller aircraft don't create a lot of wingtip vortices. They get prioritization, because they can land first, meaning that you can squeeze the most aircraft into a single landing runway than you would if you just started willy-nilly landing people. So that's why that decel is there. So you can start slowing down and get your prioritization from ATC so that you know where you're going. So, fun fact there for you, uh, if you're interested. So as you can see here, we are still descending through 8,600. Getting closer and closer to the ground, ready to land. Boy, this was a short flight. I really didn't mean for it to be this short. I was going to, you know, aim about an hour. It looks like we're going to be, I think, a little bit under an hour. Uh, we'll have to see once I uh, get finished with this video. So, as a pilot, I'm really ready to go. We're going to put our anti-skid uh, brakes to one because it is a nice dry day, or at least right now it looks like a dry day. So the um, we don't need a lot of braking force. We're just going to put our anti-skid to one. That will be more than enough for us as we land. Now, I'm not going to put down my flaps just yet. I'm going to wait for us to uh, continue to uh, head towards the runway. I'm actually going to start to put flaps down uh, when it gets to the cell, and we'll put it down there, and we'll have some fun. And uh, going back to the wingtip vortices for uh, one second, uh, the reason that you see these planes with these funky-shaped wings, one example, 737, you see these giant wings going up into the air, and they look a little bit bent. They look like they're bent outward. Well, and they're actually not bent outward. What they are, are they're there to disrupt the wing vortices. What it allows it to do is get amazing performance with gas. If it wasn't uh, having the winglets on there, you would be consuming considerably more gas, well, you kind of get rid of that when you add those wingtips there. Uh, they're very helpful. And uh, back to when I was saying they look kind of like they're uh, pointed out, well, when you're actually in flight, your wings flex. They're not fixed. They flex. And they flex up enough to where those curved winglets actually are straight up and down. That's how far they... Uh, you know, flex. If you look at the 787 head on while it's flying, you see the tips of the wings way above the fuselage of the plane. That's how Boeing created it. And they did that because it minimized the wingtip vortices by a huge factor. Because basically the air is going out of the bottom, curling up and pushing down on the wing. And allowing them to have a smaller and smaller surface will make that air kind of just go into the air behind it, not pushing down on the wing, which helps it out with uh, everything and anything. So we're going to get closer here, so I'm going to start uh, with my approach. You see these diamonds here? They're actually aircraft. And if you see the numbers by them, that's where they are in relation to me. A negative number, see this one right here on the left, it says negative 20. It means it's 2,000 feet below me. Negative 5, 
500 feet below me. If it's plus, they're above me. Just an interesting thing for you. So because we have that all set up, we just passed the cell. We're going to put our flaps at 2. I'm going to say flaps 2, and our flaps are going to start to go down. Just slightly, though. You still want to stay on track with landing, which is a big thing for us. So, we're going to continue our land here. And I want to be at about five flaps before we head down, or before we uh, turn on our final. Um, if you ever looked at an airport, and if you were a plane that wanted to do a pattern, or they wanted to go kind of, you know, go the circuit, that actually has specific names for everything. You have your base, you have your final, you have your crosswind, you have your downwind. Right now, we are on our base, or the leg right before our final. Of course, the leg that goes right to the airport to land is the final. So we're going to head there right now uh, as we're descending through 4,300 feet. We're going to uh, continue to get ready here. As we're slowing down, we're going to extend the flaps one more increment to 5 degrees. This allows us to have enough lift while we're still being nice and slow, which allows us to land safer and maneuver better. Uh, now, it looks like we might be competing with a plane. It looks like there's one to our left somewhere. We won't worry about it until it starts beeping at us. But now, looks like we're starting our right-hand turn. Going to put our flaps down one more to a full 10 degrees. And in the 737, once you get to 10 degrees of flaps, the next increment, you have to put your gear down. So we're going to do that uh, right as we approach the final. And we'll start actually putting down uh, everything as well. Now, we're going to be focusing on this panel right here, this panel that I just pulled up. You see these di this diamond on the right-hand side. That is the glide slope. That is the one that we want to be under before we hit this. If you see this bar on the bottom, that is our localizer. So at the bottom is our localizer. At the right-hand side is our glide slope. So we're going to continue down as well. We've got 10 degrees, and we're at 2,500 feet above the ground. We should be coming right up to the localizer. So I'm actually going to put down our gear. So our gear is now going down and will hopefully be uh, selected here in just one second. Yep, there we go. Three greens means everything is down. And we're starting that right hand turn onto the localizer. You see it's now coming on. We're just going to hit our VOR localizer button. And what that's going to do is it's going to line us up perfectly so that when we go to land we'll be nice and center. Now, because our gear is down, we're actually going to put it to flaps 15. Make sure our landing lights are on, which they now are with all the lights that should be on. And we're going to continue descending here, uh, which we're basically going to line up now on the glide slope. As you can see here, that pink triangle is kind of heading down now, getting closer to us. It's a little bit above us. We're going to catch it here in just a second. We're a little bit below it, but we should uh, be catching it nice and soon, uh, which if we don't catch it, it's fine. We will force it to catch, like we're going to be staying at 1,800 feet right now. Actually, I forgot to switch over the pressure, so we're actually at 1,600 feet. See, full 200 feet. And we're going to wait for, there we go, autopilot to kick in. There we go. We are now descending. We're going to arm our speed brake, and this is what it looks like with us landing from the outside. You can see our flaps are now fully extended. The lights on the right-hand side is 
uh, are on the left-hand side are called Pappy Lights. If you see, we've got uh, two white and two red. Pappy Lights are precision instrument approach lights. I think that's what it's called, P-A-P-I, precision, no, P-I, so precision instrument approach lights, P-A-P-I-A-P, -P, whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, they basically allow you, uh, when you're visually coming into landing, you can see if you're on the right path or not. If you have half white and half red, that means you're right on the dot. If you have more red, I believe it means that you're too high, and more white, you're too low. So, it also looks like it's raining, too. So, these wipers go back on here as we get ready to land in Hamburg, Germany. Kind of foggy too, but it's okay. We still have visual. We have a, an, enough of a visual range where we don't have to do anything too special now. Uh, we just need to land. We are also actually out on a remote part of the runway, so it will be a little bit uh, more of a, a taxi actually to the gate as well, and that will allow us uh, to uh, get everything. So let's go through our landing checklist real quick. Engines, start switches are in continuous. Speed brake is armed. Landing gear is down, flaps are okay, landing checklist is complete, we are ready for the landing. Next checklist is actually our shutdown checklist, so we're almost done with our checklists. Flying is checklist after checklist after checklist, and that is a good thing because it allows us to uh, make sure that we have everything proper. So we're actually now slowing to 114 knots, and we're getting ready to land. Here we go. 100 feet, 50 feet, 40, 30, 20, 10. We are now flaring, and wheels are touched down, turning auto throttle off and going full reversers. You can see the reversers coming up there, which we actually made it in quite good because there's actually a plane right there to our left. And we're slowed down enough where we don't need the reversers anymore, as well as the spoilers. Our auto brake is off. We're now manually braking. And we are turning off the runway. We're going to be following this Delta. Looks like A330 to the stands. And as we're coming off here, we're also going to turn down these lights, or not turn down the lights, um, turn down the wipers because we're not landing. And uh, we want to turn off our landing lights as well as our strobe and turn off our wing lights. So we're kind of at the minimal amount of lights that we need to taxi around the airport, which we're gonna do right now. Like I said, it's we're pretty far out right now. Uh, we need to get a little bit further in to the airport. I'm actually going to take a drink of water right now, too. And I hope you guys have um, been on planes before. You know how long these taxis can be. Hamburg Airport, a little bit different. They've got this really, really, really remote landing strip. I mean, this is literally way f too far out of our range for being normal. You'll see why in a minute. We're still taxing along here. We'll actually go outside so you'll be able to see. Uh, because it is raining, our uh, engines are picking up some of this water. Now, it's kind of now going to be dependent on how fast this Delta plane is going to go. It's an AI aircraft, so we don't know how far it's going to go. We'll see. We're going to turn left here, I think. Yep. And we're going to be following the Delta A330 all the way to the gates. Drop! Wait, wait, huh? Should have landed the left hand runway. I always forget when I fly into Hamburg that uh, you want to land on the left-hand runway, or you're going to be way out here. So, let's see, because I think there's a, yes. So if he, if he goes straight, 
or turns left. What is he doing? Turning left or going straight? Turning left or going straight? Turning left or going straight? Okay, he's he's turning left. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to get around him. <laughs> I know. We're so professional right now, right? So turning around him. Try to get in front of him now. Go a little bit faster than I like. We just want to get in front of him. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. So now we can get in front of him. So we'll 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 have a little bit faster of a taxi now, uh, going about 30 knots. Where as when you usually fly a plane or taxi a plane, excuse me, you're usually only about eh, 20 knots. And I forgot to turn off autopilot, which was slightly turning us. But we're still good to go. So, I don't know. Is this view good for you guys? I think it is. I like this view. Uh, we'll be passing over a river. Uh, in real life, this is actually a bridge. You actually travel over this bridge when you uh, go in. There's also uh, uh, a road there as well. So, planes would be going above uh, cars driving. Kind of interesting. And we're still heading on over here. But wait, there's more. We still have a little bit longer to go. Promise, I'm trying to make this as fast as I can. This is totally up on me landing on the wrong side of this airport. It's fun stuff, right? So we're going to go a little bit faster here. Kind of keep it up. Ground speed is 19 knots. We'll bring it up to 25 knots. And that'll be a nice speed that we can go at. Um, I thoroughly enjoy Flight Simulator. It's pretty fun. Uh, I like doing the flights. I like um, everything about it. I think it's enjoyable. I think it's something uh, that I kind of want to do in the future. I don't know if I, was, if I, I could ever get the chance to, but I would really love the chance to actually become an airline pilot. That's another discussion for another day and another time. So it looks like we can turn left next taxiway. There's another road that we're going to go over to. So we're going to turn left next taxiway, like so. Should be on that center yellow line, by the way. I'm not. I'm also a smaller aircraft, so I can maneuver a little bit better uh, than the larger aircraft. Now I'm going to completely disregard looking. Actually, I'll give it a little bit of a look here. Not over there. And we'll come over here. And no aircraft over here taking off. So we'll just fast taxi over here. And we will turn right, like so. And now, I want to head over to those gates right there. Hopefully we can find a spot. And since we're in Hamburg, Germany, the main airline over here is KLM, or Royal Dutch Airlines. And uh, they are the big airline uh, in mainland Europe. Called mainland Europe because there is, uh, you know, the United Kingdom, which is not mainland Europe, and is predominantly controlled by British Airways which we happen to be flying right now. Amazing, right? So, we're going to take a left-hand turn. And we're going to head down this way. See where that delta plane is. See how far back it is. Oh, hey, look, it just made it. <laughs> Slow plane. So now we're looking for an open gate. 
Any open gate will do. Let's try to find one, hopefully. If not, well, we might be stuck here and the plane might get mad at us. Hopefully that will not happen. Just any gate at all. Any open gate. We'll take one. Continue heading down this way here. I think there should be some on the other side of this terminal. Looks like this is the KLM heavy terminal. You can tell that by all the big aircraft. There's a 737 to 747. So you see a, there's actually a plane taking off in the background too, which is kind of cool. That's why I like flying with U UI. It makes it more realistic. You see planes flying, taking off, taxiing around the one way. Uh, I think it's better than just flying in a world all by your lonely, lonely self. But anyways, let's see here. Any spots for me? Oh, come on. There's got to be one. No. Guess this just doesn't want to give me a spot. Full airport for us. Uh... See, this is also something that's not realistic, too, um, is that uh, you are able to find <laughs> parking spots. <laughs> uh, and you're actually assigned ones, and there's ones that you're specifically going to. Me, it's kind of like we're guessing and checking. Which kind of looks like we're sucking at it. So we might end up just making our own parking spot. Literally, like making our own parking spot. By doing this. Let's squeeze in between these deltas. Because I'm sick of trying to find a gate. I want to get out of here. I think you guys have had enough of me for the rest of today, right? Okay, just making sure. And we're just gonna stick our small little aircraft right into here. Like so. Between these two 767s that are in heavy spots, we're just gonna stick ourselves uh, right here. And, uh, look at that. We just parked. Parking brake set. We are good so what we're going to do we're going to come in here since we're now at the gate we can close down our engines parking brake is set we can go into our fmc and go ground connections turn on some ground connections for us so that we can unload our people turn on there we go ground power and we're gonna go like that we just landed an aircraft we did a flight look at that it's that simple it's amazing and i love it this is why i like flight sim i think it's fun it's fantastic you should try it out for yourself the game is pretty cheap nowadays and if you're anything into aviation flight sim is going to be the program for you so without further ado i'd like to thank you guys for watching this video be sure to like share subscribe comment rate whatever you guys like to do and i'll see you guys next time